Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. One of the best things you can do to improve your health is get at least seven hours of quality sleep every single night. I know, I know, it's hard to get that much sleep. Your mind keeps you awake, you're thinking about things, you get uncomfortable, you wake up early and you just can't fall asleep again. There are hundreds of reasons why you can't get seven hours of quality sleep every single night and I've probably at least told you a hundred. But hey, listen, it's super important because your body heals itself when you sleep. And if you're not getting enough quality sleep, you're increasing your risk of disease and making it harder to lose weight, yes wait would you like to know an easy way to get more quality sleep every night make sure you're getting enough magnesium believe it or not around 75 percent of people don't have enough of it which helps explain why so many people have sleep problems unfortunately most magnesium supplements are not full spectrum so they won't fix your magnesium deficiency or help you sleep better there are actually seven unique forms of magnesium and you must get all of them if you want to experience its calming sleep enhancing effects. That's why I recommend Magnesium Breakthrough by Bi Optimizers. Simply take two capsules before you go to bed and you will be amazed by how much better you sleep and how much more rested you feel when you wake up. For an exclusive offer for my listeners of the Health Fix podcast, you guys want to go over to www dot mag dot com forward slash health fix and you can save up to 42 percent yes that's right 42 percent savings on magnesium breakthrough when you go to www.magbreakthrough.com forward slash health fix hey health junkies on this episode of the health fix podcast i'm interviewing dr alan Goodwin. He is a licensed psychotherapist in California, and we are going to be talking all about surviving the holidays, the mindset, watching your triggers, being aware of what triggers you, and just really having some compassion for yourself and others. The interesting thing about Dr. Allen is that he was a lawyer before he became a licensed psychologist, which I find extremely fascinating. And he also is the author of a book, Saving Face Without Losing Your Mind. It's a book all about getting the mind right before you do any surgical procedures. Not exactly related to the holidays topic, but fascinating stuff. And it ties all back together in terms of mindset, thinking about how things are before these holiday parties, what you're going to take away from them, and just how you let it impact you because you have the choice to enjoy the party, let stuff slide and just leave feeling rejuvenated or you can let it take you down. It's your choice. But let's talk to Dr. Allen as he's going to give you some really great clinical nuggets and we're going to talk about what to do if you need to peace out from a party, what to do if things become overwhelming, how to say no to parties, all kinds of things. So let's jump into the podcast. Hey, health junkies, I have Dr. Alan Goodwin on, and we are going to be talking all about how to manage holiday stress, because boy, in my practice, it's one of the main things I see over and over again, where folks will come in and go, doc, just give me needles. I just need to like zen out for the next hour so I don't have to deal with life. So I decided, you know what? When Dr. Alan came knocking and saying, hey, let me talk about holiday stress. I was like, yes, let's do this. So Dr. Allen, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thanks, Janine. It's really, really nice to talk with you. So obviously, you've coned in on it. A lot of people have. And and in your profession, you've probably seen all kinds of different ways that this impacts folks over, over the years. I always love to start the podcast out with a story. And I'd love to hear from you. Either your craziest holiday story that's either happened to you or that someone has told you we won't name any names or anything. Give us give us a little story of what what the holidays bring for folks sometimes. Um, Yeah, I don't know if I could think of a story. I mean, I'm, I'm so oriented toward not telling stories. Yeah, because I hear stories all day long that I can't ever tell, you know. 
but I mean, the, just the idea of how people are trying so hard mm -hmm. and it can blow up in faces, you know, because mm -hmm. people, everybody's different. Everybody is trying and the holidays bring all that stuff out, especially these days with all the stresses. Um, so what expectations different people have for the get togethers and what agendas people have, you know, how the, all that stuff can get activated. Yeah. And so whether it's, you know, unpleasant arguments or, you know, discussions that, that nobody really wanted to have during the holiday and you know, old baggage, there's yeah. all kinds of, there are so many pressures people deal with around the holidays because the expectations are so intense that everybody has. You're, yeah. You need to have fun. You need to be happy. There's something wrong with you if you're not happy now, you know? So yeah. it lays a foundation for all kinds of issues that can come up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's there's that, definitely that theme in life, too, of having expectations or how you expect something to go. And then when it doesn't go that way, and now we kind of, you know, think, what, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? Now, I think now's probably a good time to talk about the Hallmark movie concept. And I think this is where a lot of folks will see how wonderful the holidays look on TV with input the same, you know, different characters, same story over and over again. Have you seemed to find that the Hallmark effect does be, is like kind of the predominant thing where someone's looking for the perfect, you know, the perfect decorations, the perfect dinner, and and then of course ladies and and the perfect engagement story too. Does so that yeah. seem to be kind of how are they getting yeah. it right? It's so funny that you're asking that because living in LA, I've had clients who are writers or who are involved in the production process with Hallmark. And it's like, yeah, certain things cannot happen in, in those stories. You know, they just are not designed for certain things to happen that do happen in real life and that are really unpleasant. I mean, I think in psychotherapy, we're always trying to strike a balance between, you know, not being overly focused on the negative, but then also not needing to ignore the negative, not needing to ignore that there are struggles that get activated around the holidays. We're always struggling, but there are particular ones around the holidays. So yeah, of course, I mean, those movies that, you know, present a picture um, without struggle or with every struggle being resolved, you know, struggle being minor and every struggle is re resolved. Yes, yes, it's it's quite impressive. It's quite impressive how that happens. And, yeah. and yeah, you know, I, I also found myself, you know, getting lost in those movies and going, I wish my holiday, you know, would be this way. Now, I I came from a fun family of, 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 let's put it this way, folks who really like to drink. And so this too, I think the drinking side of things, the eating side of things can really bring up things for folks too, if there's some eating disorder kind of backgrounds as well. So of course, my, my big first question is, all right, we know, we all kind of know our issues. How do we start to plan for heading into the holidays? What's the first step folks need to really start thinking about to, to survive the holidays? Well, I mean, there's knowing and there's knowing. So the first mm -hmm. thing is really understanding what's going on for you. The, uh, what I practice is a form of mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapies. It's a goal-directed form of therapy, um, focuses on people's strengths mm -hmm. and, um, and, and um, identifying uh, honestly what the struggles are and honoring that everybody's struggling all the time, you know, even when we're having fun. I mean, there's there's a struggle to maintain the fun. And so, I mean, the Eastern ideas are the ones that I'm drawn to that are more about um, being real about that, the, that core struggle that we experience. So all of that stuff gets activated at the holidays, mm -hmm. and, and especially around expectations. And of course, substance use is about coping. It's about coping with all of this. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's really a kind of a form of leaving of not being as present and it makes it easier to be there. And so, you know, if we're gonna do some therapy around that, what we'd be looking at is, you know, what is the desire to leave about? Because, you know, we use that 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 term tripping. I use it all the time in therapy, but not just for drugs. We trip in all sorts of ways. In other words, we leave, we're less present. Really meditation is about coping with the tendency to trip, to leave to not be present with myself, with you in this moment. And so anytime we're tripping, anytime we're leaving, anytime we're 
using a substance or texting excessively or thinking, analyzing excessively, meditating excessively, exercising. I mean, even healthy things we can do as a way of getting away from the world rather than being more present. And so anytime we're doing that, we have the opportunity to step back and say, what was I leaving? Anytime I'm going to something, I'm also leaving something. And so one of the things we work on in therapy is trying to be more aware of what I'm leaving and when and why. And the demands that I'm placing on myself and on other people and things around me have a lot to do with whether I feel like I'm feeling essentially burnout, you know, like I can't, I have more on my plate than I can manage. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, so it brings me to uh, an image I have from last Thanksgiving and, and my family, I'll call my family out. They, they're cool with it. So we're sitting around and I was looking at all of the folks like 40 and under every single person at one point was on the phone, like just all in the same room, sitting there on the phone. Now I had my older cousin basically say, I'm checking the phone at the door this year. So she's like, this year, everyone puts their phone at the door. You can keep your coats on. I'm putting a space for the phones. Now let's put it this way. Is that necessarily healthy or should we have that ability to be able to leave if we need to, or do we excuse ourselves to the bathroom? You know, what what do folks do if they need to, to leave for a minute? They need to just peace out for a minute. What's, what's the proper, not proper protocol, but what's a good protocol? That's a great question. I mean, just the fact that you're asking the question shows an awareness that a lot of people aren't willing to have, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's just not okay, you know, and the reality is there are all sorts of reasons why people need to peace out for a little Mm -hmm. bit. People who are introverted Mm -hmm. are usually way too demanding on themselves and um, too aware of everything that's going on around them. They're much more aware generally than than people who are extroverted are. Mm -hmm. And so it can be really exhausting being in a get together with with a lot of people. So, I mean, you know, one way to cope would be to dose yourself on it. And if there are ways for you to get away, like on a micro level from a conversation by, you know, putting your plate away or <laughs> going to the bathroom or refilling your your water or drink or seeing somebody that you haven't talked with or I have to go talk with them, you know, finding some way to get away. And can't you script that ahead of time? You know, again, on the subject of demands, isn't it okay if it will help you for you to prepare ahead of time, even with lines, not dishonest, it's just being prepared. You know, there's a a guy wrote a book about um, stress inoculation. Mm -hmm. That's what he termed it. So like, yeah, like the analogy to to getting a shot for malaria, if you're going where there's malaria. So before you go to a place where you know emotionally you're going to get activated in certain ways, you know, cognitively in terms of you know your thoughts, your perceptions, how you interpret stuff, how you tend to get triggered because of the way that you tend to feel when you you know think certain ways. So preparing for that, you know, I know Aunt Rose tends to do such and such. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how can I be ready <laughs> yeah. for it? You yeah. know. It, it helps to prepare ahead of time. And and for preparation, and, and this is something, folks, I'll, I'll give you guys my little scoop because I I adore my family, but they all have their intricacies, much like many families do. And oftentimes I'll run run the scenario through my head because let's face it, you know, when you're working on yourself, but your family members or certain people aren't, they're going to be in their same loop pattern. But what you can choose is to to change it, right? And so I've always been like, all right, I'm going to brainstorm how it may go because it's the same every year. And then I think about like, okay, for this situation, I'm going to do this. For this situation, I'm going to, you know, and, and try, right? I can't necessarily say absolutely it's going to go my way because now we're back to expectations. But um, would you recommend for folks to sit down and maybe even write it out? Maybe even kind of come up with like a plan in their head? Yeah. And you could even um, you could even create invitations where you, you know, set a certain expectation for what we want this get together to be about. You know, (laughs) I mean, the holidays bring up all sorts of feelings like grief. Mm -hmm. Um, You're always aware when you're together with family that there are certain people who aren't there. Um, that you'd like to be there, whether they relocated or people passed away. Lots of reasons people get divorced. 
and yeah. still we can have mixed feelings about you know missing those other people who aren't still there um so you you can for instance set the expectation of really trying to be mindful of celebrating mm -hmm. that we're, we're we're all together you know especially after covid um that you know we're here that we're healthy um avoiding certain topics you can identify certain topics you know like the ones that we know about you know yeah. politics <laughs> you know how people should be you can avoid certain ways of being like teaching yeah. is a good thing to try to be mindful to, to avoid try try to be aware when you're being taught by someone and it's irritating you it's feeling disrespectful and so if you can if you can go and you know another um inoculation is the need for respect and mm -hmm. instead to try to be compassionate because exactly what you said i mean some one of the problems is no matter what um what steps we take ahead of time some people really aren't are, aren't available to do this kind of work on themselves and mm -hmm. introspection you know mm -hmm. so you know you may not invite certain people or be prepared for the way certain people are like you were saying that's a i think it's a great idea to just be be aware of how you are going to get activated you know there's this the metaphor people push our buttons we've all heard that expression you right. know you can add to that by thinking you know you have control over the power that that is connected to that button you know mm -hmm. you're the power source so mm -hmm. how much it impacts you when your button gets pressed simpler way of thinking of it is when they press your buttons it's going to hurt more if you've got a bruise there so mm -hmm. before you go to the party heal the bruises be 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 less vulnerable I like that. I like that. I would think about that too with the pushing the buttons and, and the power concept is you have the power of how you react to it and you have the power to brush it off like you were saying too, which is just, some of it's deep, deep, right? We have some conversations in the family that are deep stuff. Um, I think what I would say next, you know, just kind of looking at it, let's talk a little bit about going to the party versus being the host. Because I think that can also bring up very different triggers for for certain folks. Um, if someone's going to be the host, what kind of things do you think that those individuals should be thinking about ahead of time to help them with, say, getting, you know, helping with preparing the meal, say, helping with help during not like during the day things of that nature that may be triggers and same thing with them you know sometimes a lot of hosts i'll find that they they end up in the kitchen the whole day and then they feel like they missed the whole party yeah it's it, it's just really hard and it's complicated because it's not just the host it's the mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. it's what you know so you can say well okay easy answer the answer is don't make unreasonable demands for yourself mm -hmm. you know be kinder to yourself that's definitely true mm -hmm. make things manageable definitely true um, but but the reality, and this is where it just is difficult, and this is where in therapy a lot of the time we're just honoring, yeah, you're confronting a really difficult situation because like some family members are not um, are not part of that program, <laughs> you know, so they're going to have certain demands. They're going to come to your home um, with a demand that you know, party be a certain way, the dinner be a certain way that a certain food be served and that it be served exactly the way they remember it, you know? So what demand can you let go of within yourself to satisfy that other person's demands? Mm -hmm. I, I like distinguishing expectations from demands because really, you know, it's understandable for me to expect or want something to go a certain way. If I'm going to be really depressed afterward, what it's revealing to me is I had a demand that it mm -hmm. be that way, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a more intense thing than just an expectation or a desire. Mm -hmm. And it, this stuff is is hard. You know, there's a lot of wonderful work written about vulnerability mm -hmm. and the, the power of vulnerability. And that's all wonderful. I, I agree with it. It can really, you know, un, undermine a sense of shame that you struggle with inside. But um, what I was referring to before about not going to get togethers like this to in too vulnerable a state is be aware of what needs you're coming to the gathering with mm -hmm. you know because some people are just not going to take care and nurture those needs effectively right. you're going to need to 
Right. Right. You know, that brings a really good point out that you said choosing not to go versus going. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I think a lot of people, you know, don't go to parties and and maybe make it not the best situation because they won't call and say they're not going to show up. They just don't show up. Kind of the cancel culture slash ghosting family members concept. Say you, you've you got a party, say you've got something you've been invited to, and you're like, I just am not in a place to deal with this right now. How do you back out? How do you weigh it out? What do you do? You know, it's a really good question because what, what, it, what it draws attention to is the intrapersonal versus the interpersonal, right? There's a question of how do you manage it within yourself, the intrapersonal, but that's a different question than how do you manage it with somebody else? What do you say to them? Because mm-hmm. I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, some people, no matter what you say, no matter how, quote, appropriate what you say is, no matter how kind what you say is, it's not going to fly. Mm-hmm. It's just not going to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. And so being aware of that, that you have control over your intentions, you have control over you know how you try to treat people. Um, but you don't have control over whether it sort of works, whether it creates that effect in the other person. Mm-hmm. And and with regard to who you invite and whether you go, um, one of the problems with the holidays is it brings together some people with some other people who behave in really toxic ways. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes you, you do have to cut off relationships with those people. And, and you may do that. And, and nobody notices because you don't have to get together with them throughout the year. But then the holiday comes and it comes up again. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, one option is to really be mindful of what get togethers you make yourself a part of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if it's worth it to go through all the stress leading up, because I've had patients come to me and go, I mean, it, it's been, it's like late October. And they're like, I can't, I can't do Christmas this year. And you're like, wow, it's late October. We got month, you know, like weeks before you have to deal with this. You know, this is a lot of thought process focused on something when you could be enjoying your life. And Christmas brings up a whole other, I mean, as we've been talking, maybe because it's sooner, I'm thinking yeah. more about Thanksgiving. Sure. But, you know, there's the whole gift giving yes. part and the pressures, the financial pressures people are under. And the mm-hmm. standards they feel like they have to meet and what mm-hmm. gift giving even represents. And there's an interesting other dynamic that happens around Christmas time, which is now, and I, I don't I don't know, my sense is when I was a child, this was not true. But yeah. um, now it's not uncommon for grandparents to have more resources than um, parents do. Mm-hmm. And so gift giving um standards that the parents are trying to set with their young kids uh, can be violated by the grandparents because the grandparents want to give more and can give more Mm -hmm. but that that creates a problem you know when i was growing up um it was more i think it was more common for parents to be in a better financial position than their grandparents than their parents were you know I definitely grew up that way. Definitely. Yeah, I think there's been a huge shift. And and I think that is a huge thing. I've heard that a lot from different folks. And now it seems that a lot of folks are gearing up and, and panicking because of inflation and, and what's happened now in, in this situation. And yeah, it's it's so hard. How How do you work with folks on going back to the true meaning of gift giving? where it doesn't mean the most expensive gift is the best gift. How do you work with folks on sorting that through? I I think it's about talking about values, about really Mm -hmm. what do you value? And this is where it can become difficult because like some parents do a great job talking with their young kids about Mm -hmm. what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what do you do if if the grandparents come over with like, you know, six or eight gifts? Yeah, Yeah. you're like, oh no. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, and I think it. This is where I think the Eastern approaches are really speak to me because it's about compassion. It's about recognizing, you know, these are difficult issues and um, trying to have open dialogues with people again about your intentions. Mm-hmm. Where you talk with people about oftentimes when you're trying to 
do something difficult like this, just letting the other person know what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, what your intention is. And I want you to know, I'm, I'm trying to explain something to you that is difficult because I, I don't want to not seem like I'm grateful. I don't want to not seem thankful and I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be insulting to you. So I hope you can hear it that way. Just having a dialogue that includes that talk about the dialogue mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Mm hmm. And and like doing this, say, maybe a month before Christmas, doing this right after Thanksgiving. Everyone does a powwow after Thanksgiving dinner. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, what when would be a good time to to sit down, say the grandparents and say, hey, look, we're trying to instill this in the kids. Help us out. So it's funny. So I'm going to piggyback on the powwow thing, because I don't know if yeah. this is what you were talking about, but just yesterday. I was talking with somebody about the conversation after the get together, the conversations ah. after mm -hmm. the get together that can be like really unkind. Yeah. That that can be the place where, you know, did you taste that apple pie or, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. That those can even be a lot of triggering or people calling someone later and saying, Oh my God, the pie was too mushy or, you know, the chicken or chicken, the turkey was too dry. Yes. Yes, yeah. that can be a thing. And and yeah, I was kind of talking about that, but also like when do you bring up the 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 expectations for for Christmas gifting kind of thought process. One of the things that's that's usually talked about by therapist types around this time of year is the idea of the way the expectations can cause us to trip ourselves up because people are going to be who they are. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, you can use the holidays to sort of reassess who, mm -hmm. what your values are and, you know, have you been living consistently with those values and, you know, new year, new you, you can, you can make resolutions and everything and all that's, you know, good. Um, but uh, uh, one of the ways that we can disappoint ourselves is by expecting everybody else to be behaving in ways that they just don't, you know. And mm -hmm. so how can you prepare ahead of time? You can do your best to talk with people and to plan for it, but also to take steps to prevent certain things from happening. Mm -hmm. And it, some of the things we've already talked about, it could be about who you invite. It could be about really some people need more firm limits, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. um, we're really not going to have more than one gift per person or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or we're, oh. we're really we're having a gift the price limit mm -hmm. and you know in the past we've done this and it's very generous of you you usually go over but really <laughs> we want to ask you not to do that because you know some people really don't feel good when that happens you know so having a real direct conversation with people yeah i, I agree with what you're implying ahead of time can be really helpful yeah yeah. No, I, I like that. I like being direct. I think that's something that's been lost in society quite a bit. This this concept of tiptoeing around the real conversation. I I find it it's it's interesting that a lot of people are more in the the ignore it and maybe it won't happen category is what I found. But it seems that the more direct you are, the more the the response comes back. You might not like the response, but at least you got it out there. Yeah, it's hard. Don't you think it's kind of kind of a, a, a bipolar? I hesitate to say that because I don't mean the term, the yeah. like classical term, yes. but it's like you've got social media where everybody's used to people being just way too blunt, rude, downright rude, you know, saying things that you just would not say to someone's face unless you're really behaving in an obnoxious way. And then on the other hand, because of that, you've got people who are so avoidant of interactions because it seems like interactions just blow up. You know, one of the things I talk about in therapy is, you know, we try to use metaphors in therapy. It tends to help. So one is um, in life, you know, you're going to struggle. Everyone struggles. Um, one way to think of the struggle is we encounter open flames throughout our life. People treat us badly or stuff happens. It, what I have control over isn't that. What I have control over is how flammable I am. So whether I nurture myself, whether I'm exercising, sleeping well, um, eating well, 
taking care of my physical and psychological needs. That's the stuff that's really going to help me not be as flammable because I'm, I'm going to encounter those people. And, and one way to think of what I encounter, the open flames, is with compassion. I'm, you know, you can say I'm going to encounter, um, I don't know if I can swear on here, so I won't, jerks. <laughs> okay, I'm going to encounter jerks. Um, but, but a different way of looking at those people is I'm going to encounter people who are struggling. And I've struggled. And, and so I want to try to expect them. And I, I, can co I cope differently. I take it less personally when mm -hmm. um, I see a person's struggle underneath their bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like, I like that. I like that. The flammable, how flammable that I'm going to, I'm going to use that. Um, Cheers. It's, it's definitely something, you know, I think about, I'm going, you know, even just like someone cuts you off on the freeway and you have the choice to be just like inside into flames or, you know, you can just smolder, you know, put it down the smolder and let it go. And I'm thinking, you know, yeah, there's a lot of different things that can cascade, let's put it that way, until it becomes a stick of dynamite and you blow. And that is, it's something that I think is a very important, important topic. Folks, you got it. I mean, this is huge right here. And I think that's almost one of the ways I'm thinking to prep myself for all of the holiday day stuff, you know, going, okay, do, do I choose to be become dynamite, a stick of dynamite? Or I'm going to let it smolder and and let it go because we don't know people's stories. And I think that's one of the other things that's really important is, you know, we we know someone face value because we don't necessarily get to know them very well. Some of the relatives, maybe we don't even know well, and we just don't know their history, where they're coming from. And sometimes having that compassion to meet them where they're at and just accept that they've had some stuff under their belt. Yeah, um, it, definitely. I was looking a minute ago for the sheet of paper. I don't see it right here. But what what I use in, in therapy with clients is a simple triangle with double sided arrows on all sides. And the corners of the three of uh, the three corners of the triangle are thoughts, feelings and behaviors, because those three are interacting and causing each other all the time. So like the expectations we were talking about before, you know, and, or, or the demands those are thoughts, right? Those are interpretations. What what I believe has to happen, how I believe people have to treat me all the time. But the more intense those are, the more intense the feelings they're going to trigger when somebody cuts you off, you know? And for a long time, I used to think, um, okay, if I've ever done it, I have to have compassion when someone does it to me. <laughs> and so like cutting someone off, like, damn it done that <laughs> you know yeah but, but then I got to a point I think with the mindfulness work I got to a point where no the whole compassion idea is whether I've struggled in that way or not mm -hmm. I really it really can have room for recognizing that they're struggling yeah yeah even though I've never done that mm -hmm. I can have compassion for a person who's struggling so much that they're doing that and the good news is the worse they behave because some people in therapy, sometimes we talk about, you know, the person will say, yeah, but what about someone who does this? I mean, come on, that's unforgivable. You know, really, the more outrageous a person's behavior, the more clear there's a struggle going on there, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that's a huge thing to think about that a lot of people don't really bring to light is, is that struggle and, and what they might be going through. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you are going to expose yourself to their struggle again. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to trust them if they're not able to behave in trustworthy ways. You know, it just means um, recognizing that their bad behavior toward you is, is not because you deserved it. It's because they're struggling and they're reacting in really unreasonable way yeah 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 so i guess now i'm thinking about you know compassion i'm thinking about there's the struggle i'm thinking about impact on you and and let's let's go i'm gonna be devil's advocate for a second what if it gets to the point where you're just like i i've tried all my tools i've tried to be compassionate i've tried to go through this and you're just so triggered what what would you say is good etiquette when you're like i just have to leave i have to get out of this situation 
what would you what would you tell someone to do or you know what what's a good thought process i'm glad you're asking that i i, I really one of the frustrations i've always had i i was a lawyer before i became a psychologist so i, I wasn't oh, wow. yeah i wasn't first drawn to this field and so i come at this kind of with a, a kind of cynicism i think um and so i always try to not talk about my own problems with my clients because that's not you know it's their time but to not give the impression that I don't have some of the same struggles we're talking about. This is about being human. And so I think the first thing is to really be kind enough to yourself to acknowledge that there's a really difficult thing going on right now. It's kind of, there's an analogy, what we're talking about right now, to a panic attack, where you feel this intense, um, this intense urgency, you know, I've got to do something now. So depending on how intense the urgency is, I think you need to give yourself permission not to have the right line, not to have the right words. You really can just get out of there. Like someone's driving and they're having a panic attack. The first thing they need to do is pull over, you know, ideally find a side street, but somehow get yourself out of danger, pull over and, and then get to a place where you can get out of your car. Ideally you can, walking it tends to be helpful. It can activate it in some people because it can change your breathing in a way that exacerbates the panic attack. But the point is to get yourself to a place where you can regulate yourself. And that's different for different people. Breathing tends to help. So getting out of there and then doing a breathing exercise. And the key in the breathing exercise is the exhale. A lot of people don't realize that. They inhale and they're already inhaling. So it just makes it worse. <laughs> you wind up inhaling too much. Oh, so, no. so the exhale makes room for the for more inhales but yeah getting yourself out of there however you need to yeah yeah i i think that is something that you know i've been in the situation where i have an uncle who just really likes to drink and i was always who he would latch on to when i was a kid and i'd get to hear all the stories and stories and then by like the third year of me hearing the same stories i started to be like i don't like get away and of course all the family members are enjoying you know drinking things of that nature and they're not paying attention to the fact that i was trying to get away and i couldn't and and so i ended up in one situation running out of the house and just running as far as I could. And it's probably like negative, who knows what in the middle of the winter in Illinois. Um, and, and I think for a lot of people, this is, this is a true, like real experience where they're, like you said, I need to, you just need to work on your exhale, like get out away from the situation. And, and going outside is my, my favorite excuse in this case, where I'm like, I'm going to go take a walk. You know, and usually the kids will go with me, which I'm fine with. <laughs> you know, I'm going to play with the kids. So I don't know if a lot of people, if this resonates with anybody, but I certainly like the idea of that longer exhale, even if you have to like jump in your car. I think just... it's a, yeah, great idea to just go walk. And and you, you're also reminding me, you know, you might talk to other people, to other family members who can be resources at those times. Mm -hmm. You know, if you see me on the couch with Uncle Joe, <laughs> help help please please come <laughs> over you know yeah. i like i like this strategizing with the family ahead of time you know your your people who are your like go-to folks that's yeah. something i would be thinking you know that could be really really useful and I, I don't know how many people do that i know some probably do but this is great time to bring it up find the yeah. family members yeah, yeah. And, and again, I, I would just emphasize coming from a place of compassion. Mm -hmm. Everybody is struggling. You know, mm -hmm. that, it doesn't, it doesn't excuse, you know, somebody, you know, drinking too much and being obnoxious. It doesn't excuse it, but that's really not the point. It's about how can you cope with the behavior that you may not be able to stop. And again, there's the issue of, you know, what kind of atmosphere do you want at the party? and mm -hmm. deciding you know whether everybody's going to be invited that makes makes perfect sense that makes what you're going to serve <laughs> you know down to i mean down to the t i think planning ahead and this is why i definitely wanted you to come on and check because i think planning ahead is huge now of course i want to talk about your book a little bit um saving face without losing your mind because all of this 
in in terms of holiday parties, there is that saving face component that, you know, just like I'd mentioned the, the full on kind of anxiety of having to get out of the house and run, you know, I think a lot of people are also looking for <laughs> some sanity um, just in general this yeah. time of year. So tell us a little bit about <laughs> your book. Um, give us the background. I love the picture on it, by the way, if it's. it's on oh, point. thanks. Yeah, thanks. Me too. Um, so it's playing on that that phrase, saving face, but it really is about cosmetic surgery. And it's become so common. I mean, like 20 million procedures, invasive and non-invasive every year, just in the U.S. Wow. And it's very, very popular in other countries, too. So the many, many, many people are are changing the way they look in minor and in major ways. And so um, saving face without losing your mind, the subtitle is bringing mindfulness to your cosmetic procedure. It's about doing it in a mindful way, knowing when to do what and when to stop and what demands you're placing on yourself. How important are you making your appearance? That I don't intend to tell you whether to have a procedure or not with the book, I'm just intending to um, provide some tools for people to use to assess what their values are and you know how people can get caught up in um, changing themselves on the outside, really when oftentimes what they're wanting to change is something on the inside. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I sometimes like to think about the holidays as that time when you haven't seen folks for a while. It's almost like your, your high school reunions where you want to look so good right. with this facade, this appearance. And then it either goes the way you want to, or it doesn't. And and sometimes, you know, I, I don't know how much, I don't think anyone is doing face uh, uh, surgical procedures to impress their family at the holidays per se, but um, maybe, I mean, that that is a thing possibly, but what I'm getting at with this to link it folks is that it's much like the impression, trying to impress people, but really what's going on inside. And, and same thing with the holidays. We can tie this back as to, you know, being aware of what's going inside you and, and working on you because you can't change other people. That is for sure. And a big part of this is about body image. Yes. And body image stuff gets activated at the holiday parties. Yes. You know, there's all the desserts and everything. And there is still shaming. Mm -hmm. You know, you're supposed to want the desserts. And yet, you know, there are people who will be shaming you mm -hmm. if you have the desserts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it really, it really raises those questions we were talking about before about who you bring and what people's behaviors are, who you invite, in other words, to the party. Mm -hmm. And how do you protect yourself so that you allow yourself to enjoy yourself at the party and not yeah. be so consumed with the body image issues? You know, we for, we treat our bodies. Sometimes when, when people get too compulsive about that stuff, they don't respect the body's ability to recover mm -hmm. from, you know, a, a piece of pie or two mm -hmm. or whatever, if you will overindulge. Yeah. And so some of the things we were talking about before about, you know, using food as a drug, using mm -hmm. alcohol as a drug, you know, you have to be able to reassess afterward, sort mm -hmm. of debrief within yourself and mm -hmm. forgive yourself. Yeah. 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 No, that, I mean, now I'm thinking about other things that I've seen in my family, what I've heard from other people, what I've seen on TV shows, things of that nature. You know, my family was always like, mm, a moment on the lips, the lifetime on your hips. So watch out how many of those you have, you know, in, in one aspect. But then at the same thing, my grandma was always like, if you weren't cold or hungry, this is my Polish grandmother. If you weren't cold or hungry, something's wrong with you. So it was like food, food, food. My, and then the other side of the family was kind of like, hmm, what's going on there? And, you know, then we have that judgment. And so I think a lot of people might even experience this kind of thing. And especially for women, you know, if, if a family member is like, honey, you're looking a little pudgy lately. Or they're like, you are so thin. You need to eat more. I mean, the mind blown kind of concept that happens in your mind with that is yep. out of control out yep. of control, yep. which it is hard. So planning, planning ahead on that one for sure. And, and eating disorders. I mean, that's a whole another topic for, for stress for folks. 
with with the holidays. What what do you typically have folks do in that plan? Do you have them working with nutritionists to plan out like how the the holiday is going to go or how does that work um, on your end? What's your protocol? It's a great idea. I mean, a lot of it depends on what people are willing to do, Mm -hmm. what they can do, what they have access to. Mm -hmm. You know, nutritionists are you know, so helpful when people can have access to them. Um, but, but you know, some of the ideas with regard to managing the way that you eat also apply to managing your finances around the holidays, just planning ahead, mm-hmm. um, noticing, you know. So, for instance, you can, you can prevent overspending by noting what you're spending and by, um, by, by being mindful about it, by tracking what you're spending. And we know that um, there are a lot of uh, diet plans that work because part of it is tracking, just Mm -hmm. keeping track of what you're eating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another thing about diets that work is they allow people to be human. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, certain foods are pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to deprive yourself of that um, is really not a, a sustainable plan. You know, yeah. So all of this, what I like about the way you're talking about it is that it's enabling us to have a conversation about reality. Mm-hmm. That these things are difficult, mm-hmm. you know, managing balance and striking a balance that's healthy. It's mm-hmm. difficult. And sometimes you'll overdo it, you know, one end or the other. And so being kind to yourself and allowing yourself to recalibrate is, I think, a really important part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. So I think the takeaway and and help help me with supporting this here, Alan, is that really it's it's having a conversation with the others, having a conversation with yourself around the holidays and knowing what triggers you, what kind of things are going to come up, who might be the key players, and going in with with a, a plan and options to adapt should you need to. Yep. That's really what mindfulness is about. Nice. Being nice. mindful, being aware. And um, and preparing ahead of time really helps. That's what that stress inoculation is about. Knowing how you, knowing yourself, knowing how you tend to get triggered. Mm-hmm. And over time, you can work on that. Mm-hmm. But um, but being real with yourself about whether you, you've licked it, whether, or, or do you really need to prepare still because it still triggers you when so, so-and-so does this or that or says this or that. And you, you know they're going to say it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. You can can almost guarantee if they if they're the the same culprits. Like I mentioned before, every holiday for me, there's certain things that are on repeat and it's just gonna happen. And you just have to be like, okay, wait for it. I almost get to the point now it's comical because I'm like, wait for it, wait for it. (laughs) And on cue. All right. And then box checked. Step one just <laughs> happened. Perfect. Now, now this is a holiday, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I tend to find humor in a lot of things. And I hope that a lot of folks, you know, can take that away too. And really just kind of be it, be it like it is, say it like it is. And, and, you know, I think for a lot of us, the holidays have gone a lot so far off of what they mean. And, and that's the hard part is is just getting back to connecting with your family and and just really being able to have good solid conversations and avoid other ones if you if you can and when and now like for me i go play with the kids so <laughs> or the dogs the, isn't that like the best you know what folks that is, that is something we should mention if there are dogs cats any critters that's yeah. like instant bring the like stress <laughs> down yeah yes invite the critters yeah. Yeah. So when in doubt, if there are any animals around, go to the animal. You guys, I mean, that's all you guys know me. I I have golden retrievers. And like, for me, it's like, as soon as like things that hit the fan, we're like dog outside play good. So, well, Alan, I think we've talked about quite a bit in this realm of giving folks some good tools to kind of literally save face over the holidays. But I really do want folks to have access to your book because the mindfulness around the surgical procedures too, and and how many people really are trying to to use these as a boost and then feeling empty inside afterwards. I think this is a huge concept. So give us the scoop 
Where can folks find you on social media, on your website? Where can they get the book? Give us the whole breakdown so folks can can follow you and get to know you a little bit more too. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, I have a TikTok channel. It's Dr. Alan Goodwin and nice. um, Instagram. And uh, there's some meditations on YouTube also. And my website. And at my website, I try to uh, describe the type of therapy that I do. Okay. And yeah, the book really does focus on uh, preparing for making the decision about a cosmetic procedure and then preparing for it before and after. But it also focuses a lot on what we do in therapy and how mm -hmm. mindfulness can help us understand really what our values are, how we're treating ourselves. And mm -hmm. so it's a broader focus in the book. It's primarily aimed at the cosmetic procedures. So there's a lot in there about mindfulness. So yeah, saving face without losing your mind is the name of it. It'll be on Amazon this week, it's coming out. Excellent. Excellent. This is, this is great. Alan, Cause I'm thinking for a lot of people, I mean, having been in the medical field for over almost 20 years now, it's, it's a, it's a big thing. And, and looking at the, the whole aspect of before and after um, any cosmetic procedure. And I think for, for a lot of folks, it, it is something that we, it's not addressed. You know, you're going to go into the surgeon, they're going to show you all the amazing things that they can do, but there's not you know, the, the concept upstairs. So are you helping folks? And I, I know you're licensed in California. Are you, you working with folks just in California or are you also doing telehealth? How, you know, how does it work for folks that want to get in touch with you? Yeah. Telehealth has, has blown open the opportunities a lot. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure you know, um, so you can see people in, so for instance, because I'm licensed in California, I only provide psychotherapy to mm -hmm. people in California, but um, coaching when it's appropriate, you mm -hmm. can do over state lines, but it would be different than psychotherapy. Sure. So yeah, sometimes I, I do that with people across state lines. Okay, excellent. Yes, thanks for sharing. I know definitely folks, you do wanna be aware of state um, things and and having folks making sure they're they're practicing within their scope of practice and in and proper states. So if you're in California and and you do in person visits as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm in my office yeah. now. Nice. Yeah. Nice. It looks nice and cozy. Very zen like I'm seeing seeing tidbits of zen. So folks it, very chill over there. Yeah, so, that's my gong behind me. That's what I was wondering what that was. I was like, I'm seeing something back there. I was curious. Excellent. I mean, a little bit of the Eastern medicine can never go wrong. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for coming on, folks. You can find him at Dr. Alan, A-L-A-N, Goodwin, G-O-O-D-W-I-N.com. You can learn more about him there. And we're just hoping that we have passed on a little bit of, of gems for you guys to all survive the holidays. Thanks again Thanks. for coming on. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. It's really nice talking to you. Same here. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.